Your squash looked fine yesterday, and now it's laying limp like a drama queen. This is not a watering issue. This is an inside job called the squash borer, and that's what we're going to look at today. I've grown plenty of squash, and I've never had squash vine borers. But don't let that discourage you because we are going to look at scientific journals, published meta-analysis, etc. and so forth to determine what it actually looks like to not only get rid of them now, how to prevent them from showing up next year. They have shown up already this year. Number one is the eggs. They're bright red. They're usually in the bottom of leaves at the base of any sort of squash plant. They're in clusters and they're gross looking. Those eggs will hatch and make larvae and larvae is what actually pen penetrates into the stem and causes all of the damage. Now, the time in which you need to start looking for these eggs or looking for this pest is when your daytime temps are continuously over that 21 degrees Celsius mark. Between 21 and 27 is like the sweet spot for these guys. So once it starts to get to that temp, you want to do once a week inspections of your plants. Bikini, zucchini, summer squash, and pumpkins are most definitely at risk of being harmed by these guys. And we tend to see them late June into early July. The northern spaces, we only see one batch of these guys. So as long as you stay on top of them that first little few weeks, you won't see them again and they won't continue to amplify. In the southern spaces, however, you guys typically will get two shots of them in your ear. And that's the trade-off for having longer summers. Mm, sucks to be you. Only in the aspect of squash vine board. Otherwise, no, you're fine because it's warm wonderful all the time. It snowed in a huge portion of Canada this weekend. It rained for three days straight here and it's so cold my fingers are frozen and I want to be wearing a jacket but I don't want to be wearing a jacket and look great. So the number one sign if you don't see the eggs is actually sawdust looking material around the base of the plant. So if you have squash and you oftentimes have this pest you may choose to not use mulches that are lighter in color. What you may choose to use is no mulch and or peat mulch. If you want more information on that, I did a whole video on using peat as mulch. These are great ways to be able to make a surface in which you can easily detect a problem and when it's present. Now the fix to this is simply cutting the stem and then cutting it along the side, removing the squash vine boards wherever they may exist. And then you can very easily reroute that the same as you would a tomato so you don't have a massive loss when it comes to the squash itself. And there is a potential for still some harvest because we're just looking for that plant to reroot and you would treat it the same as any plant you're rerouting. So it's pretty easy to do. Next up is in-season preventative measures. This is how you protect against them late June into early July without chemicals prior to actually seeing the sawdust or the red eggs. Number one, I think is pretty obvious and that's row covers. I personally have used wetting tool off of Amazon because it's incredibly inexpensive. Everyone says it's not UV protective, it's going to fall apart. I've had mine for like four years now and it is completely fine. I don't know what is in the wetting tool, but it lasts as long as a marriage does. You're okay if you go that cheaper route. Number two, I discussed in my pest prevention video, and that is actually using tinfoil. Wrapping tinfoil around the base of your squash, literally making a little donut and kind of crinkling it around, that is another great preventative for not only the borers, but other ones as well. Adult moths are attracted to yellow, and that is because squash oftentimes have very yellow looking flowers. So they know where they need to go and how to get there when they see it. It's a beacon of light when they see yellow. That means you can actually trick the moths into getting stuck to sticky traps. This is the event, one of the few events in which I would say use those yellow sticky traps because it's going to work in your favor. The moths will get stuck and they can't lay or make any babies. Unless they're kinky, of course, then maybe they can. Trap cropping. This is companion planting at its finest. One example of this is blue hubbard. Planting this nearby in high densities will lure the vine borers that way and then you can actually damage, destroy via heat or however you want to the trap crop and ultimately destroy a lot of population when it comes to this pest. And then timing. I mean, this one is goes without saying, but it's obviously it's not easy to work around because it's literally in the heat of the season. You need to plant late May, early June. 
and they are going to arrive late June, early July. You can't wait until mid-July to plant these crops unless, of course, you're in one of those regions that are warmer in nature. But just your regular climate where we are, for example, northern U.S., Canada, it's not an option for us. But if it is something you may want to consider. Okay, so say you have the issue. The issue is so bad, it's almost uncontrollable. Every year, despite all your best wishes, continuously causes problems. Don't lose all hope. There are some things you can try. Okay, so the top one to two inches is actually where the larvae overwinter. So what we need to do is remove the vines and the leaves that were infected and not compost them, throw them out. Unless you are incredibly confident in your ability to hot compost and cook these suckers, don't risk it. Throw those in the garbage. Once we've done that, we now have soil this soil, I would highly, highly, highly encourage you to till the baby bejeebus out of it. This is going to expose the pupae to cooler temperatures, obviously, that are coming after the harvest season, but also expose them to predators by putting them on the soil surface. So you can rototill once, twice, several times, and tell the snow flies just to help make sure you've got those top one to two inches in which the hangout. Next solution, in the event that it's completely taken out the space, you're already at a loss as to how you're going to get anything out of your cucurbit area, you can solarize. And I would solarize in the heat of the summer for four to six-ish weeks. I've done videos on solarization, so go check those out. But essentially, you are cooking the soil. Yes, you are going to destroy the microbes and everything else in that space. However, those will come back very quickly once you add compost, etc., and so forth. But we want to get rid of the problem that is preventing you from growing any cucurbit. And of course, crop rotation, any sort of beneficial that is amplified by repeatedly putting the same crops in the same space are also amplified when it comes to the bad guys. So you're amplifying, amplifying both the good and the bad when we choose to go this route. So if we want to avoid the bad, we want to rotate our cucurbits around the garden as much as possible raised beds, this is obviously really easy. If you rototill, you only want to rototill the infected space rather than the whole garden, which will then spread the pupae around possibly and cause more issues. We also don't want to rototill in the diseased or the damaged plant debris, which of course is also going to exasperate the issue. Now, if you've not been able to stop them from the damage, you can do wave planting or succession planting, meaning you're going to plant after the borers are done, they're done their damage and then hope that you have a late frost. The other option is, again, like I had mentioned, those resistant varieties or vining type varieties that will allow you to propagate from the node. So again, vining like, I don't, I don't actually don't think I mentioned that, but vining like plants can be propagated from the node and be okay. There are a number of different examples of this and there's something that will allow you to hopefully get a harvest. So the moral of the story is that yes, you can hopefully control those vine pores if they're present. If they are present and they are not manageable, we can then prevent them for the future crops that may exist and or navigate them around them gently. So get crew yet to let me in the comments down below if you have issues with vine bores, if you have how you got rid of them, if you have and you just literally have accepted them as part of your life, I'd be interested to know and I will talk to you guys next time. Bye!